Nobody is above the law. That's a proper American sentiment, isn't it? How does New York's 34-count indictment against Donald Trump measure up to it? On another legal front, should Congress ban TikTok? And what are we to make of the revelation that at least one FBI field office set out to create a spy network within Catholic churches? We will discuss these issues and probably more in today's episode of Independent Outlook. Hi, everybody. I'm Graham Walker coming to you today from the Independent Institute in Oakland, California, right across the bay from San Francisco, where we try to bring you an independent take on the issues of the day, keeping an eye in particular on the fate of liberty. And as always, I'm joined by my colleague and friend, Dr. Williamson Evers. Hello, Bill Evers. How are you, Graham? Very good. I'm glad to see you again. Appreciate your coming with us uh, for the ride, as you always do. Uh, of course, Bill Evers uh, is also the director of the Independent Institute's Center on Educational Excellence and well known for his work in education, having been an assistant secretary of U.S. Secretary of Education, actually, some years back. But also, because there's some interesting legal things to discuss today, we are joined by another one of our colleagues, uh, William Watkins, Jr. Hello, Bill Watkins. Good to see you two gentlemen. It's great to see you too, and uh, very glad to have you with us because we want to talk about some legal things, and boy, you're like our legal guy for sure. Uh, Bill Watkins uh, has been a law clerk with the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit. Uh, he's been a prosecutor, a defense lawyer practiced law in various uh, state and federal courts. He wrote a number of interesting books. One was called Judicial Monarchs, The Case for Restoring Popular Sovereignty. Uh, more recently, he published this great book with the Independent Institute uh, called Crossroads uh, for Liberty, very much uh, worth reading to rediscover the uh, uh, angle that the Anti-Federalists had at the adoption of the U.S. Constitution, available, of course, not only on Amazon, but on our own independent.org website. And if you want to know more about uh, Bill Watkins' insights on the law, you could find him in various law journals, uh, Duke Journal of Constitutional Law and Public Policy, for example. And also, he's written popularly in Forbes, USA Today, Washington Examiner, and many others. So, Bill Watkins, we are very grateful to have you. And I should have mentioned, he's also a research fellow, officially affiliated with the Independent Institute. So shall we get started? And I'm going to turn to you, Bill Watkins, to begin with. And, and by the way, just, you know, as a pointer, uh, because I've got both Williamson and William on, on the program with me today, I may have to say Evers and Watkins. No disrespect intended, gentlemen, if I use your last name. So, Watkins. Um, so so um, what's this thing about... Uh, the 34-count indictment being brought by, uh, I guess, New York's uh, District Attorney Alvin L. Bragg. Pretty fascinating. Um, I saw in the news that uh, one of the persons involved in the background of the case, of course, is Stormy Daniels, uh, the by now well-known adult film star, uh, apparently. And uh, she said in an interview last weekend uh, that she really didn't think uh, that Donald Trump should be put in prison for what he did to me, she said. So, so I thought that was kind of generous of Stormy Daniels. You know, he shouldn't be put in prison for what he did to me. But then, but then the more I read about it, the more I wondered, well, what exactly was she talking about? Like, what crime against her is, is Donald Trump accused of doing by Alvin Bragg? Can you answer that preliminary question first, Watkins? Well, Stormy Daniels should thank... President Trump for making her a household name, and I'm sure her Twitter page <laughs> and other social media uh, has profited greatly from that, because I don't think very few in America knew who she was until she was catapulted to national fame uh, by our former president. But what we have here in the indictment, as you said, is 34 counts, and it's all related uh, to Miss Daniels and some other similar conduct with a Playboy bunny, a doorman perhaps uh, at Trump Towers who claims to have knowledge of a love child, uh, which most people believe is patently false, by the way. But nonetheless, because she agreed uh, to some hush money payments pr prior to the election uh, back in 2016, uh, here we have the DA in Manhattan uh, going back uh, years ago to that election and essentially trying to prosecute the president or former president 
uh, for the hush money payments insofar as essentially it's a records violation that the Trump organization allegedly at his direction falsified business records to make the payment which Michael Cohen, uh, Trump's former lawyer, paid to Daniels uh, look like a, a legal services in the record keeping, which frankly is a misdemeanor. Right. Well, just, just to like, there's <clears throat> details to unpack there, and I need you to unpack them. But very preliminarily, among the 34 counts, was one of them that Alvin Bragg was accusing Donald Trump of committing a crime against Stormy Daniels? No, it's a, a crime against That's the what state. I thought. That's what I thought. And, and isn't a record-keeping violation something that the Clinton campaign had to pay a fine for and not face criminal charges when it put down the payments for the uh, dossier, the Steele dossier, but it, it registered those as legal services? No, that's absolutely right, Dr. Evers, is that campaign had to pay a substantial fine because they recorded that uh, improperly, uh, and they had to pay the Federal Election Commission in that regard. In this case, the Federal Election Commission, by a four-to-one vote, declined to uh, uh, proceed uh, against the Trump campaign or the president uh, on this particular matter. Now, wasn't there also a case involving former Senator John Edwards and a girlfriend of his where it was also alleged that a payment was actually oh, I remember campaign this. related. Yeah. Uh, no, that's right. Bill... This was back in uh, the 2008 campaign, uh, and he was indicted and charged. I mean, it was a sad situation. His wife was dying of breast cancer. Yeah, uh, He kept right. the mistress, had a child by the mistress, and got a donor uh, essentially to funnel money, a uh, very similar situation to try to keep that matter quiet. And it was a campaign finance violation, uh, same Ac as- accord according, according to those who charged him. Right, according to the indictment, uh, he went to trial in this case, and uh, the Justice Department could not convict him uh, what was uh, the jury uh, could not return charges against him uh, or could not find a verdict of guilt. They were hung up on everything else. Case goes away. Uh, the Justice Department never retried him. And remember this, guys. This isn't some some local yokel trying John Edwards. You know, Maine Justice uh, would have sent out their best and brightest for such a high-profile case, and they couldn't convict him. But, but just so to wasn't, be really wasn't wasn't part of the problem whether such a payment was entirely for campaign purposes or whether he might have some sort of normal motive of being embarrassed about this and not wanting to have it publicly revealed at any time, and certainly with his wife of. Uh, vulnerable, emotionally vulnerable, as, as obviously, but also in this dying situation, and that it had to be, according to the regulations, that it had to be purely a campaign-related thing in order for it to be a violation, and doesn't the same problem apply in Trump's case? Oh, and before you answer that, Watkins, just to, <laughs> to be totally clear, um, somebody might think to themselves, you know, vague recollection of the John Edwards case. So, but, but wasn't he in fact guilty of uh, uh, cheating on his wife? And so why, why wasn't he nailed for cheating on his wife, John Edwards? Not a, not a because <laughs> it, in modern America, it's, it's just like the Stormy Daniels situation. Here we are right. arguing about record keeping uh, and whether that's a violation rather than a violation of one of the Ten Commandments. Uh, Americans right, don't right. care about that. They care about other things, and that's a sad commentary, but you're absolutely right, Graham. Yeah, people get confused on this point. So we're back to Trump. So the reason, the reason that the statute of limitations hasn't passed, what, what's the reason for that? I got confused on that. I thought the statute of limitation had passed on the payments. All right, well, here's, if it was just a record-keeping violation, the statute is gone. Um, there is 
it's too late because it's a misdemeanor offense, uh, a minor offense. However, what the DA has done is to try to give life to the charge to say that the record keeping violations were an effort to conceal another offense or further another offense, which would be the campaign finance issue. And therefore, under that theory, it elevates it to a felony offense, though in the indictment, he doesn't spell out what other crime um, is involved here. So the felony crime would be against a federal law prohibiting the use of campaign funds uh, for this purpose. Is that it? That is correct. And there's a question under New York law, can you even bootstrap uh, a federal charge well, to this state well, record keeping charge? Be be because, because many legal scholars would say it has to be another New York felony in order to So compound. the question is, can a New York district attorney indict for a violation of a federal law? Is that is right. that? But there's another problem that that Bill Watkins just brought up, and that is the fact that the, the, the DA does not specify what it is that is the further crime. And I, the co constitutional law, the whole practice of Anglo-Saxon jurist, Anglo-American jurisprudence, is you have to know specifically what you, the accused, are defending yourself against. Else how can you prepare your defense? And by leaving this essentially blank, he's violating the rights of the accused. Is that right, Watkins? No, that's right. He should have, if he had the goods, spelled it out in his indictment. Uh, however, you know, Trump's lawyers would be filing, if they haven't already, what we call a bill of particulars requiring the prosecution to lay out what the actual offenses are. And that motion, though in a lot of cases it's filed uh, just as a standard motion and never really granted, uh, but in this case it matters because, as Dr. Evers pointed out, from the indictment itself, we don't know uh, exactly. We're assuming a lot, but there's also in the factual summary an allegation about tax charges and that could only be that Michael Cohen uh, had to pay more in federal taxes than he otherwise would because of his reimbursement. So it's kind of strange to prosecute someone for causing more tax, not less, to be paid. It's an odd theory I've never seen. Yeah. Oh, so you mean if it, if it had not been a reimbursement, it would have been income to Cohen, and Cohen oh, wouldn't have had to pay taxes on it. Is that the point? Right, that uh, uh, essentially, since it was not legal services per se, as it was recorded in the billing records, uh, he paid income tax on that money uh, uh, that wasn't for legal services, and therefore he paid more tax than he would normally have had to do otherwise. And again, so you're prosecuting the Trump organization and Trump for causing someone to pay more taxes. It's not like they were <laughs> withholding okay. taxes due or causing someone to withhold taxes due. It's a Alice in Wonderland charge. Right. So if, 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 Michael Cohen, if Michael Cohen cooperates and they win against Trump, does that mean that Michael Cohen will get a tax refund? <laughs> <laughs> I think Michael Cohen at this point uh, simply wants to you know, have as much blood spilt from his former boss as he can since he had to do three years in prison uh, for other charges. So it seems to me there's another catch-22 involved here. And that is, what if instead of, so the Trump people paid this out of Trump business money. Uh, what if they had paid it out of the campaign. So the, the in a sense, the brag DA guy is saying you should have done it as a campaign because that's what it really is. But if he had done it as a campaign, that would have also been a violation. And Der Alan Dershowitz, the retired Harvard law professor, has pointed out that that's very peculiar to force, to try to legally force somebody to make an illegal campaign 
finance expenditure. No, you're right. The whole thing stinks to high heaven here. I mean, let's think about this. The Federal Election Commission, by a solid majority vote, said we're not fooling with this. Uh, the Southern District of New York, uh, the federal prosecutors with jurisdiction over this, declined to go forward uh, on this case. So there you have two heavyweights that, you know, again, no love for Donald Trump necessarily, that passed on a very marginal, minor matter. And you have a DA who, in campaigning and getting his job, promised he was going to go after Donald Trump. And voila, oh, we have an indictment I in see. 34 counts. I see, I see. So Is it possible? Uh, go ahead, Evers, go ahead. All uh, right. So it seems to me, just reflecting on all this, that classical liberals have raised all sorts of red flags about campaign finance laws. And mostly the emphasis was on restricting free speech and uh, indirect incumbent protection. And the, here another thing is flourishing, coming to light, and that is that Petty rules can be used, ab abused, to try to knock a candidate out of the race. So I they're they're trying to some how bootstrap based on rules that the regulatory commission for this topic doesn't even want to enforce. So it's amazing, and and it's certainly an invitation to other local DAs around the country to abuse this kind of thing. So what Watkins has explained thus far about the 34-count indictment makes me see it, uh, which is kind of, you confirmed some of my suspicions, as a pretty darn weak case that might not have been, been brought in other comparable situations. So in other words, make a real simple question, Watkins. Is it possible to loathe Donald Trump and also think that this is a silly and weak indictment? No, I think that's what reasonable people conclude is we have just gone head first into a realm we've never been in in this country. As you started off this podcast, no one is above the law. Absolutely correct. Yes, but this I is say the three first cheers former to that. president that has been criminally charged. And we're going to cross that threshold on this garbage of a charge in state court in New York on record keeping for clearly political purposes. You know, what are we becoming, a banana republic? Mm -hmm. So even so, if you don't like Donald Trump, you could still think this is a pretty stupid case to bring. No, you should. Even if you want Donald Trump to never see the inside of a public office as a elected leader... Uh, you should reject this case as a bridge too far and harmful to our system overall. So two additional thoughts occur to me. One is that Alan Dershowitz, to, to bring up his insights again, says, of course, this can succeed in Manhattan. It's a very anti-Trump area, and the jury, uh, the judge will not be able to be uh, avoid social ostracism if he were to rule in favor of Trump and he might uh, the judge whoever you know this judge has ruled against Trump plenty of times in the past but let's say he listens to the kind of arguments that we're making here and he says I'm throwing this out this is ridiculous whatever he will be he's elected the judge the judges are elected in New York and uh, he will be a social pariah. So that, that's not a really great situation for the rule of law. And secondly, with regard to the phrase, no one is above the law, I think that's an excellent principle. But wh where was Hillary Clinton prosecuted? Where was, uh, you know, the various FBI people prosecuted? Where were, were her the crimes, people who lied? Were her crimes were people, comparable? Were her crimes comparable? I, I'm not asking that. I'm just saying, if you say the, the phrase, no one is above the law, huh. and then you also say Hillary Clinton violated the law with regard to destroying 
uh, subpoenaed evidence, or you say uh, various CIA and FBI officials lied to Congress and nothing happened to them. Right. You can't really say that in practice we're living up to this. Uh -huh. No, I think so one... I just... Sorry, Bill Evers, go ahead. No, no, I'm finished. My point. Now, I think well, another important point to remember is even Trump in the 2016 election, do you remember the crowds and he egged them on? Yes. Lock hey. her up, lock her up. But as soon as he won that election and, saw, and he was asked by the press, what was he now going to do to Hillary Clinton? He said, oh, the Clintons are good people. Nobody's going to bother the Clintons, a admitting that that was all campaign rhetoric. Even mm. that, even Trump, that was a bridge too far for him to go. Uh -huh. he, he shouldn't it's sick the justice system on a political rival who had, had been defeated. Uh, but right. not so much for the Barr, Democrats right now. And Bill Barr's, again, Bill Barr is hardly a sycophantish fan of Donald Trump. But Bill Barr has a uh, autobiography, one damn thing after another. And in <laughs> it, he clearly states that he had a private conversation with President Trump in which Trump told him, despite these crowds having said lock her up, he wasn't going to pursue this case and that it was would be too much like a banana republic for the victor to prosecute the defeated candidate. Wow, what a contrast. And 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 Barr says he was quite surprised by this. But mm -hmm. Trump was clear. So there's a bit of a pattern here. Um, I think Donald Trump so infuriates certain people. And, you know, maybe I get that for a number of reasons, but, but the effect he has on some of his opponents seems to be to, to push them into making exorbitant charges against him. So I'm just thinking back. This is this is way beyond normal law here. I'm talking now, but thinking back to the two impeachments uh, by the Democratic majority in the House. Uh, in the, the one impeachment was for you know inappropriate uh, use of uh, for, foreign influence to affect a cam domestic campaign when he wanted Zelensky to have a prosecutor look into you know the apparent misdoings of Hunter Biden in the uh, Ukrainian energy company. So. That was a, that was not a real strong case, and you know the Senate didn't didn't uh, remove him. Then the second impeachment was about January six, and everybody you know is alarmed at January six, and rightly so. Uh, but they they insisted on framing the articles of impeachment in the House, the then Democratic controlled House, as incitement to insurrection against the United States, like they could have they could have said about Trump, well it was it was irresponsible conduct unbecoming a president. Um, but they had but, to but, frame but it. But that's in, in not the most a, but, but that's not a high crime and misdemeanor. Well, high crimes and misdemeanors are you know difficult to define constitutionally. But in any event, my point here being, it seems that there's a kind of a, a compulsive need to frame charges against Donald Trump in the most extreme terms possible, which then weakens the, the outcome of the the desired prosecutions. Any comments on that, Watkins? Or am I am I over? Am I seeing a pattern that doesn't exist? No, you're definitely seeing a pattern. Uh, I mean, you're correct. The whole Steele dossier and all that uh, you know, proved to be what it is. There's, you know, Trump and Vladimir Putin colluding to put him in office. You know, that was proved to be, you know, the garbage it was from that dossier. And then the charges and uh, a number of people close to him, of course, uh, charged on uh, lesser matters. Uh, impeachments of uh, January 6th, it's no, the people that are pushing for this are not going to be happy until they've got some sort of criminal conviction. And again, this is why I say this is banana republic stuff. You have uh -huh. Vladimir Putin puts rivals in jail. Uh, right. Other third world mm -hmm. dictators, Robert Mugabe, will put a rival uh -huh. in jail, uh, uh -huh. we know from history. Uh, and that type of person. Are, are we, we really want to be associated with such conduct here in the name of the law. There are other pending legal actions where Donald Trump seems to be in the crosshairs. Um, I don't know if you have a list of those in your own head, but I'm thinking of the case by E. e. Jean Carroll, for example, and the question about offsite 
classified documents, and then the question in Georgia about uh, trying to overturn the election by scrounging for votes, uh, and then uh, the question about um, uh, the U.S. Justice Department's investigation of whether there was an attempt to overturn the 2020 election illegitimate. There's a bunch of other potential legal cases here. Am I right to wonder that this first round with Alvin Bragg, because it's so kind of outrageously weak, might actually backfire on those who'd like to nail Trump because it sort of sets the stage with a weak case. Am I right or no, I'm missing something? No, to the extent that he's charged in other jurisdictions with more convincing evidence, weightier evidence, uh, charges that perhaps should be looked into. Uh, we don't have that right now, but hypothetically, this uh, goat rope in New York you know, <laughs> certainly hurts all these other any legitimate effort that might come after uh, this is going to taint it. So the Democrats are really just shooting themselves in the foot by applauding Alvin Bragg and touting how this is upholding the rule of law when th this has just made Trump more popular, it appears in the polls as they see that believe uh -huh. he has persecuted the people. Um, and to the extent legitimate okay. charges are out there and need to be charged, this is going to color that. Yeah, what a strange way to proceed. Well, uh, mm -hmm. the, many people in the news media, both regular journalists and pundits, have said the effect of this is just what they want. They want to have lots of attention on Donald Trump and lots of martyr effect so that he goes up in the polls and wins the Republican nomination. At the same time, they expect that his legal troubles will bring down his support among independents and undecideds and middle-of-the-road voters, suburban moms, for example, and that uh, Biden will just overwhelm him in the general election after he gets the nomination because he's been made a martyr. And I'm not, I can't mind read other people, but it certainly makes sense. Surely they couldn't be that Machiavellian. They couldn't be Ma that Machiavellian, could they, Bill? Yes. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> okay. Let's turn the page, shall we? Uh, I think we've, we've kind of clarified as much as we can until some more facts emerge on this particular subject. But while we've got our legal expert here, there's a pending piece of legislation in Congress that I'm kind of worried about. Maybe I'm over-worried, but so uh, Senator Thune from South Dakota and Senator Warner from Virginia have co-sponsored this uh, act. It's called, hmm, if I can get this right, Restricting the Emergence of Security Threats that Risk Information Communications Technology Act. That is to say, the Restrict Act, which would enable the president uh, to shut down TikTok because TikTok is so widely controlled by the apparently the Chinese government and has such big influence and could undermine U.S. security. So, I mean, what good patriot wouldn't be in favor of the Restrict Act? And, and I guess all of us who are unhappy about extreme partisanship, we should all be glad that a Democrat and Republican are coming together to sponsor a patriotic Protect America Act to get rid of TikTok. Um, and yet... It raises some strange questions. Either of you want to comment on banning TikTok? Well, I I think it's uh, a big mistake. I mean, there's First Amendment issues. It's obviously a speech platform. Uh, many candidates and political commentators use TikTok. It's also uh, it's also the case that. Uh, TikTok has offered all sorts of reasonable uh, cutouts between it and the Chinese government. And thus far, there's no evidence that the Chinese government has interfered with TikTok as it is now. There's not been presented. And, uh, I, you know, I just think, I mean, U.S.-owned platforms are all around the world. Are we going to yeah, but the U.S. owned platforms to... aren't owned partly by the U.S. government. Well, right? the the question the question is, 
could the U.S. intelligence agencies use backdoors into uh, some of these platforms? Uh -huh. I'm not in any position to know, but I could imagine the government of X country, Burma or someplace, saying, yeah, we don't want any, any of this Facebook here. We don't want any of this TikTok here. We don't want any of this Instagram here. We don't want any American things here because whatever. So I just, you know, it's, it's a, it's feeding fundamentally the anti-Chinese nationalism that's going on and the protectionism that's going on. And it's to the advantage of various U.S. tech companies. They are platforms similar to TikTok that various U.S. companies have, but that have not been very successful. If, if TikTok could be banned or restricted, these companies, again, like Facebook and so forth, would be able to have their like platform suddenly capture an, a large market share. They are delighted to stir this up, and they have been spending money to stir. Well, Bill Watkins, um, here's a question that this is probably a misleading question or the wrong question, but so somebody could say, uh, well, does the Chi so violation of free speech if we ban talk to TikTok, but does the Chinese Communist Party protected by the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution? First, I would say that if TikTok voluntarily wanted to shut down because it has absolutely no cultural or societal value, I would support that decision. But uh, to your <laughs> point, uh, to the extent TikTok does not want to do that, uh, yeah, absolutely, they have rights that must be respected and um, yes, uh, Mr. It, Evers also, is right it's about It's also the, the American listener, the, the American viewer. In other words, suppose I want to hear Saudi TV. What is businesses of the American government to prevent me from watching Saudi TV? Now, that's the bottom uh, line. It's not the government's position uh, to discern whether w we should be uh, dealing, watching TikTok or whatever. Saudi TV is another his example. Uh, that's not their business. And uh, how about our debt? Maybe they could work on that a little bit rather than worrying about TikTok. But there's another <laughs> thing. So one of the one of the things that's pointed out is that like other high tech platforms, TikTok gathers the data of the users. And so the thought is, well, isn't this terrible? And somebody might misuse it. But they're forgetting that on sale, on the market right now, is tons, all this sort of data is, on the, is available for sale right now about all of us. And, you know, to say, oh, it, the United States is not in a position actually to block the Chinese government from buying this yeah. on the open market. Not, not necessarily the TikTok stuff, but all the other stuff that's available. So if you're concerned that internet companies that use data in order to target advertising and pitch various things to people are using information about the user, it's a long time too late. This is the, the way this business operates. And one more thing on that. Yeah, but this is... Beware of the law of unintended consequences. If you remember, uh, Kamala Harris mm -hmm. made a big deal about getting the escort uh, site back page shut down, which had servers in the U.S. Uh, back page actually cooperated with law enforcement all the time, helping them track down uh, child prostitutes, teenage girls who were being trafficked, um, when Kamala shut them down, another site similar to Backpage sprang up, but with servers overseas where they didn't cooperate with law enforcement. So you still have escort websites, same as Backpage, but just no access to try to work with law enforcement to stop child trafficking. Similar here, just watch out for unintended consequences when you start... Um, interfering with these tech companies. So there's another aspect to it. We have been, I think, rightly concentrating on TikTok, but this statute, this proposed statute, the Restrict Act, 
is very vague. It says, like, any community. I mean, it allows the president to declare an emergency about any communications or information transfer company and do whatever he wants with it. It's unbelievably open-ended. And, you know, this is certainly why the civil liberties organizations think this is a terrible, terrible course. Yeah, so I don't understand why Senator Thune thinks that's a good idea. I'm less surprised about Mark Warner, but apparently Senator Thune, Thune thinks that ambiguity would be just fine, and he wants to give a pretty open-ended grant of power to the president, whether it's uh, Joe Biden or his successor. That that part surprises me politically, but I don't know. Maybe I don't know enough about Senator Thune. No, you know, and it's, then, um, you know, um, they had sense. I suppose they would have a sunset provision on it to see who the successor uh, was. Yeah. But oh, you're right. It doesn't make good sense. It seems like they think it's going to play well in Peoria right now uh, yeah. among the public. Mm -hmm. But as for a, a proper subject matter that they should spend time with, not at all. Well, here, here's one other angle just to be to try and make sure that we're not missing something here. Um, I think we're going to come to the same conclusion about kind of overbroad and unintended consequences. But one last one, I mean, one last sort of devil's advocate try on this most restrict act, uh, and that is, you know, arguably the biggest abuser of free speech and free communications in the world is the Chinese Com uh, Communist Party. You know, they have billions of Chinese and others whom they influence. They control the information flow very tightly. They suppress stuff on TikTok and other platforms that they don't like. They pressure no, Google and Facebook no. to suppress stuff that's unfavorable no. to them. Shouldn't we leverage them? <laughs> the Go Uyghurs, ahead. all the plight of the Uyghurs is all over TikTok. The plight of the Hong Kong protesters is all over TikTok. Uh -huh. All these things that are direct slaps in the face of Beijing are all over TikTok, and they have not suppressed it. So I think that, I mean, I'm not saying it couldn't happen in the future, but I'm just saying it's, you know, anticipating something that has not happened. I think you gave a good retort to my devil's advocate. I'm sorry, I kind of interrupted you <laughs> no, in the it's process, fine. but I mean. It's fine. I'm going to change the subject in a minute. Do you want a last word on this one, Watkins? TikTok? Other than I can tell you I've never been on TikTok or seen it, uh, <laughs> but I can't imagine anything good comes from it. But I support TikTok's rights. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. If people want to learn how to dance on TikTok, let them do it. Um, so uh, here's another legal I, I question. Get, I, have, I have one other thought. Okay. Another thing that is said, oh... TikTok causes people to commit suicide or have depression or have mental health problems. You know, it may be a vehicle for unfortunate things happening, but so are many other things. How about back fence gossip about people? How about cliques in middle school? How we about, should outlaw you know, I mean, middle school cliques. I'm, I'm, I'm in favor of that. <laughs> Anyway, I just wanted to make that last point because we really hadn't touched on it, yeah, but that is good... something that's brought up. It is. Indeed, it is. Okay, one other topic. I want to make sure I have a chance to pick the brains of you guys with all your expertise. So um, apparently it came out uh, several weeks ago that the Richmond, Virginia field office of the FBI had issued a guidance letter uh, regarding uh, information that apparently came from all some some. Um, agents already sort of secretly in place, urging the creation of a program to watch Catholic churches and Catholic parish organizations as suspected hotbeds of terrorism. And so uh, uh, the FBI had gotten apparently fairly into this. And when this came out, it seems the FBI disavowed the Richmond Field Office memo, which was reassuring. But it still makes you wonder, how could the FBI target Catholic parishes as hotbeds of terrorism. Are they that bad, the Catholics, or is the FBI that bad? I wonder which which it is. <laughs> Unfortunately, so I, I don't think... know, Bill, are you are you are you a Catholic, Bill, or are you some other thing? I'm bet Oh we don't force them to disclose his affiliations on this program. 
But I will tell you, I am a, I'm a Reformed Christian. I'm a Presbyterian. Okay. So he's a Calvinist. Correct. No, well, so but he'd be this, glad to see the FBI so, snooping so on the, the Catholics, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, obviously, this is a result of us living in post-Christian America, where we have individuals high up in law enforcement that see the activities of Christians uh, as suspect. Uh, I would say this is much akin to the Romans and other pagans believing that the early church was engaged in cannibalism uh, and such because uh, they took the sacrament of the Lord's Supper and, uh, as in the words of the Bible, uh, drank the blood uh, and broke and broke bread, ate the body of Christ. Uh, they also thought the early church was involved in all sort of sinful sexual activity because folks called each other brother, sister, that type of thing, just because they were so divorced from uh, the way, from church teaching. It did not make sense in their pagan culture. We're there here, uh, where unfortunately folks high up and some levels of government and law enforcement, having no knowledge of the church, seeing the church not as something neutral, but as something dangerous and evil, uh, seek to use power against it. Uh, we are in perilous time. Apparently, uh, Jim Jordan has actually subpoenaed the FBI for documents to reveal some of the, the details of what's really going on here. Bill Evers, have you read anything about that? I've just read the news stories that he has uh, filed those subpoenas. I do think, um, in a sense, Christianity views itself as, you know, dangerous in a sense, but dangerous in the battle for people's souls and, and not in, you know, people can be motivated by religion to do things that are unwise. And, I, but I, I know people who are in these, um, strongly traditionalist Catholic circles, the people who want to have a Latin mass, the people And these are the ones who, who apparently were targeted by this memo. Right. And uh, people who feel that Vatican II may have gone too far or that Pope Francis or whatever. They, they have, I mean, I think the three of us think it would be very great if Pope Francis would learn some economics. He but needs anyway, economics. He really does. <laughs> the point the point is there are traditionalist Catholics that feel that the church is going astray. I don't really see how they are viewed as a threat to the U.S. government or a threat to peace and law and order, you know, and, and everyday life, which would have to be the case if some committing some federal crime was, was supposedly being investigated. Yeah, apparently. It seems it seems very off base, and I agree with Bill Watkins that a lot of it is the post-Christian situation of a lot of top officials. Yeah, just to, to so misunderstand. Even, even if they are nominally Christian, they are in some kind of lukewarm mainstream church, and they, they can't understand somebody that believes very strongly, very uh, profoundly, very takes takes it as a very, very serious part of their life, which uh, undoubtedly I think we could say these traditionalist Catholics. Well, we, we can't forget what our own senator from California, Dianne Feinstein, said during the confirmation hearings for Amy Coney Barrett at one point. All right. She said that the All dogma right. lives large in you, and that worries me, apparently, is what uh, Senator Feinstein said. That was pretty stunning, and it reflects but the that, exact same they, thing. I agree with you. It's just, it's a kind of the same sort of thing. On the other hand, what business of the FBI's is in, in the, the the dogma of the Catholic Church is not that the U.S. government should be overthrown by force and violence. Indeed, okay? not. So, I mean, let's then let's forget it. I mean, it's not their business. What the dogma of the Catholic Church. It's a little, the situation is a little... As a non, I speak as a non-Catholic. Graham is a non-Catholic. Uh, but but we're, we're very familiar 
Indeed, with we Catholic are. Catholic yeah. stuff. I mean, Jesus said, you know, uh, my kingdom is not of this world. Otherwise, my servants would fight to keep me from being arrested. So it's pretty clear that he doesn't pose a threat of the type in question. Not to say that there aren't unstable people who can invoke anything they That's want. Right. I, I admit that. That's but right. Overall, though, you know, I can't help but seeing a little bit of an eerie parallel to um, developments in China over the last few decades where the Chinese Party, uh, Communist Party and the government view the growth of unregistered Christian groups in China as a severe threat to the state and the party, and in the name of which they then have circumscribed their ability to meet, torn down their buildings, monitored their conversations, um, because they really regard any, any way of thinking that pos posits an authority higher and apart from the state right. to be a threat to the state. And that part and, is and eerily it's similar. it's also Falun Gong. It's yeah. not just Catholics and Protestants, but it's right. also Tibetan Buddhists. It's Muslims. It's traditionalist Mongols with uh, cults of their own and so forth. The state in China is very concerned about independent organizations. Right. It's essential, really, that uh, we constantly remind people that the, the human spirit and you know human ideas and human thought is no jurisdiction of the state. Right. And we're a pluralist society where people are going to believe different things. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so we've covered some interesting territory here. I am grateful to both of you for helping us. Um, you know, we mentioned uh, Pope Francis. I want to just say parenthetically that the Independent Institute published a book a few years ago called Pope Francis and the Caring Society. You can find it on our website, independent.org. Very much we're seeing uh, it's a set of largely Catholic economists uh, who uh, politely <laughs> differ <laughs> from Pope Francis's approach to economics. Uh, a, a good read uh, if you have concerns in that area. Uh, and in general, we do invite you to go to independent.org for resources on these and other topics. Uh, we do our best to keep people informed. And uh, uh, I'd like to give each of you a chance for a last word on these or any other topics before we sign off. Anything you'd like to add as a parting shot, Bill Watkins? My only parting shot would just be a reminder as we live in this post-Christian world that, uh, as promised, the gates of hell will not prevail against his church. A point of optimism. I appreciate that. A, f a final word from you, uh, Williamson Evers. I say we should never underestimate the evil that campaign finance laws can do. Oh, boy. Yeah. And I want to underscore uh, Bill Watkins' point from earlier that you got to look at things like the TikTok ban and whatnot for unintended consequences because people just don't see the consequences sometimes. And it's, uh, it's worth a second thought whenever you're talking about expanding government power. Unintended consequences. Maybe that's kind of the, the summary thought for the day. With that, um, I'm going to say goodbye to all our friends far and near and invite you to join us next time on Independent Outlook. Take care, everybody, and thanks.